Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jerry Galloway, lead pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. Well, the last few weeks we've been looking at the miracle of grace in our lives. We've seen from the book of John how that Jesus was full of grace and truth. We've seen through the scriptures how that once we have received forgiveness, we have received his grace. We found through the scriptures how we can learn to live in his grace. So friend, it's one thing to receive it. It's another thing to learn to live in his grace. And then last week, we looked at how grace gives us a new identity and a new destiny. And this morning, I want to wrap up this series on grace by looking at the power behind grace. This powerful force behind the grace of Jesus Christ is one of the truths that separates and makes the church distinctive from the rest of the world organizations. This truth is a reactor that empowers grace in our lives. This truth is the guarantor of grace. It authenticates grace. You see, without this truth, grace would cease to exist. When you separate grace from this truth, grace will cease to be amazing. The gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power behind the grace. The gospel is what enables you and I to experience his grace's amazing effect in our life. Without the gospel, there is no grace. It's the message of Jesus Christ that truly authenticates grace for you and me. So if it's the gospel that's the power behind the grace, what is it that the gospel declares? Is it just a message to make us feel good and feel uh, uh, like we have some well-being in life and that life would be well established? What does it declare in our lives? Is it just a message to make me feel better about my life and what's going on in my life and what's going on around me? What is it? What does the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ declare to bring about the amazing effects of grace in you and in me? This morning, I want to share with you three thoughts, simple but profound. Three thoughts, friends, that empowers grace to be authentic in your life and in my life. You see, the gospel makes some declarations, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Number one, the gospel declares this truth. We're all in need of a Savior. We're all in need of a Savior. Now, herein lies the struggle because we really aren't sure sometimes we need to be saved, especially when things are going well in our lives. If you're in good health, if you are uh, in financial uh, blessing and you are financially secure, maybe the relationships of your life are going well, the job's going well, and the wife is wifing well, and the husband is husbanding well, and the kids are behaving themselves, and everything seems to be wonderful in your life, it's easy to stand back and someone says to you and I, we need to be saved. You're like, saved? Saved from what? My life's going great today. But my friend, there is a problem that is facing humanity today that is more catastrophic than Hurricane Irma. The human race is swiftly, and, and I would underscore that word swiftly, the human race is swiftly running down a path towards eternal destruction. Isaiah 53 and 6 says, all of us. How many is that? All of us. Look at your neighbor and say, now he's talking to you. <laughs> all of us. Notice the words there. All of us like sheep have strayed away. Notice these words. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him, speaking of Jesus, the sins of us all. If, friend, it's because we're lost in sin that Jesus Christ came to be our Savior. Luke 19 and verse 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save 
the lost. Now, the reason we're lost is because we're sinners. And we have all sinned against God. I've sinned. You've sinned. All of mankind has sinned against God. The Bible declares this truth in Romans 3 and 23. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Romans 3 and 10 says in the scriptures say, No one is righteous, not even one. Outside of Jesus Christ, friend, we are all sinners in the sight of God. This is a truth that you and I must understand. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Our very nature is sin. We are born sinners. Listen to the words of Psalm 51 and verse 5. It declares it well. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time, notice this, my mother conceived me. Before you and I have the opportunity to do wrong, before as small children we have the opportunity when our parents said do this and we belted out the word no. <laughs> How many of you know that no thing hasn't left us even as adults? We might say it a little different, but how many of you know the heart's still there behind it? Somebody says, I want you to do this, and the first thing, no. The boss says, I want you to do this. No. The wife says, I want you to do this. No. The husband says, I want you to do this. Well, absolutely not. <laughs> that thing never seems to leave us. It's ingrained in us. Nobody had to teach you that. From the time you were a little child, it belted itself out of you. And that same spirit's always been there. The psalmist said, I was sinful when my mother conceived me. You see, friend, an apple tree is not an apple tree because it bears apples. It bears apples because it's an apple tree. Before we came to Christ, you and I sinned. Why? Because we were sinners at heart. Now, some people say, well, you have your way and I have my way. So, preacher, what's the big deal about being sinners, especially in the age of tolerance that we live in today? The society that you and I are living in, everybody says, well, you know what? You have your way and I have my way. We're all okay and we're just going to do our own thing. Well, friend, here's the problem with being a sinner. The Bible teaches that there is eternal punishment for sinners. Job 21 and 30 says, For the wicked are reserved for the day of doom. They shall be brought out on the day of his wrath. Psalm 9 and 17, The wicked shall be turned into hell, notice this, and all the nations that forget God. Listen, for you to forget God, you had to know God one time, didn't you? Malachi 4 and verse 1, the Lord of heaven's army says, the day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. 1 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9 says, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Bringing judgment, notice this, on those who don't know God and on those, here's the key, who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. Revelation 20 and 15, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Friend, without Jesus Christ, there is no hope for your eternal destination in a place called heaven. The Bible is clear that sinners will perish in eternal separation from God. But you know, many today will say, yeah, Pastor, but you don't understand. I'm really not a great sinner. I'm not a, a big sinner. I've really never done anything that was, uh, you know, really somebody would say is really, really bad. I definitely have never done anything 
that would deserve eternal punishment in a place called hell. But friend, I want to remind you today, it is not the action of sin that leads us to hell, but rather the state of being a sinner. The Bible tells us that no sin can enter into heaven. I would ask you today, are you not considered a lawbreaker in our society if you break even one law? You don't have to break many. Now imagine with me for a moment that today you're leaving church. And you're thinking, you know what, man, I got up late today and I didn't get to the first service. And so we're here at the second service. And boy, as soon as the preacher says amen, I'm hitting the door because I want to beat everybody to the restaurant. <laughs> and so you get out in your car. I say amen. You run out the door. You run past the greeters. You grab the papers as you're just running out the door. You get in your car and you're in such a hurry. You put it in drive and you peel out of the parking lot. And you're driving as fast as you want down 15, down that nice, new, smooth, paved road. And you're really getting with it. And you're thinking that food's going to taste so good. I'm not going to have to wait in a long line. I'm going to get the first seat that's there. And all of a sudden behind you, this gentleman who has flashing lights <laughs> and a little siren. And he's trying to get your attention. Your false thought is, I don't have time for this. I've got to get to the restaurant. But he's persistent. He doesn't give up. And so eventually you acquiesce to him and you pull over to the side of the road and he walks up and he says, did you know that you were speeding today? And you said, yes, I absolutely do because I'm trying to beat everybody to the restaurant. <laughs> but officer, I want you to understand before you even consider anything, I want you to understand I'm a good person. Officer, I want you to understand that I treat my wife well. In fact, officer, I fixed my wife breakfast in bed this morning. And I told my wife this morning, honey, you just rest this morning. I'll take care of getting the kids ready. And I'm such a good person. And I even got everybody to church. And then when I got church and Paula said, let's stand, I stood. I didn't stand there with my arms folded, but I worshiped the Lord. And then Pastor Jeremy came up and they took the offering. And officer, I want you to, I gave extra money in the offering today. So officer, I know I was speeding, but I want you to understand how good of a person I am. And I don't deserve that ticket that you're wanting to give me because I'm such a good person. How many know that that's probably not going to get you very far? Actually, it might get you in more trouble with all the talking that you've done. <laughs> you've tried to weasel your way. Now listen to me. You say, oh, I've done all these good things. But listen, those good things don't keep you from being a lawbreaker. Friend, you and I won't find ourselves in eternity in a place called hell for any other reason than we are sinners. The gospel declares we are sinners and we're in need of a Savior. You see, sin separates man from God. God is in heaven and without the hope of Jesus Christ, friend, there is no hope of heaven. The gospel is really a picture of God's love and his grace to us. The gospel is the power that makes grace work in your life and my life. Grace God's love made a way of escape. It's through Jesus Christ. Secondly, not only does it declare that we are sinners in need of a Savior, but the gospel declares this, and I want you to really understand this one, especially in our culture today. There's only one way to heaven. Would you say that with me? One way to heaven. Say it again. One way to heaven. Salvation and the hope of heaven only comes through Jesus Christ. John 10 and verse 9, Jesus said this, Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Friend, there is no other way. Now picture with me for a moment, if you will. There's a gate. Through that gate is heaven on the other side of the gate. You can't get to heaven without going through the gate. Jesus says, I 
am the gate. I'm not standing there holding the gate. Jesus said, I am the gate. If there's any hope of you and I getting to heaven, friend, you've got to go through Jesus. Now, the truth is, after service, I'm probably going to gather all my books here and my things and my microphone and all that, and I'm going to go back to my office, and I'm going to sit down in the office. Now, if you want to come back and talk to me, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to come to the office, but you see, Colton has an office outside of mine. You've got to go through Colton's door to get back to my door. Now, yes, I have windows on the back. And some of y'all might try to come around the backside and get in so you don't have to go see Colton to get into my office. But if you're thinking about doing that, I just want you to know my windows are locked. And you can't get in that way. There's only one way to my office. you got to go through the main door. Listen, there's many people trying to get to heaven many other ways. The culture we live in today, everybody says, well, you have your thoughts and I have my thoughts. You got your religion, I have my religion. Here's the thing, everybody says, you know what, we got all these different ways, but they all lead to the same place. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's only one way to heaven. You know, there are many people who try to get to heaven on their own. There's probably no other time I cross that thought that when people are at at the time of somebody's death. I stood many times in a funeral home and people have said to me, man, they're such a good person. And we might be looking at the pictures that families set up and they'll say, boy, they were a great person. And they give you the shirt off their back. And man, they do anything for you. And I'm sure they were good people. They'd say, oh, but pastor, you just, you just don't understand how good of a person they were. But friend, being a good person won't get you to heaven. Then there are those who stand on religion. They say, well, I attend church. I support the church financially. I go through the motions of worship. I do everything. I'm the most faithful person. I greet at the doors. I do this ministry. I do that ministry. And so because of all those things, I'm sure heaven will be mine. Friend, religion, religion will not get you to heaven. There was a very religious man in Jesus' day. His name was Nicodemus. He came to Jesus asking what it would take to get to eternal life. And Jesus said these words to him in John 3 in verse 3. I tell you the truth. How many of y'all want to know the truth? Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Friend, he was very religious, but he didn't know Jesus as his Savior. Now, the Apostle Paul, we might call him one of the most religious men of his day. But until he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior and his Lord, he was lost and headed for an eternity without God. Friend, just sitting in this church will not get you into heaven. Being a good, upstanding, moral, right person will not get you there. Just because you lived a good life, just because you've been a good husband or wife, a good neighbor, you cannot barter your way to heaven. You can't earn your way to heaven based on your good works. Let me say this to you. If you could get to heaven just by being good, then Jesus Christ died on the cross in vain. If you could do something on your own enough, Jesus' blood was wasted on Calvary's Hill that day. Friend, we all believe in heaven. There's not many today that believe in hell. If Jesus didn't die to spare you and I an eternity in hell, then can I ask you today, why did he die? Why did he come to this earth and give his life? You see, you don't need his death on the cross if you can save yourself or earn eternity in heaven on your own. But friend, works won't get it. Morality won't get it. Just being a good person won't get it. There's only one way to heaven. One way to heaven. And that's through Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. Boy, that's good, isn't it? Would you read that with me? There is salvation in no one else. 
God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Say it again. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Salvation is is found in no one else. There's no other way. There's no back door. There's no back window to get in. It's only through a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't earn it. You can't merit it. You can't work enough. You can't do enough. It's only through Jesus Christ alone. John 14 and 6, Jesus answered them and said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Notice this. No one, underscore that, no one, no one comes to the Father except through me. There's no other religion. There's no other religious leader. No other person. No other higher power. He is the only one and the only way. Jesus Christ is the one way to heaven, the way, the truth, and the life. Scripture declares that we are sinners in need of a Savior. The gospel declares this, there's only one way to heaven. Last of all this morning, the gospel declares that only you can choose Christ for your life. Only you can choose Christ The words of Joshua to the people of Israel, choose today who you will serve. Friend, you must make the choice. God has given each of us a free will. Listen, God won't force you to go his way. God won't force you to go to heaven if you don't want to go to heaven. God won't force you to go to hell. It's a choice we make. He'll let you go your own way if you want. Remember the words back in Isaiah 53 and 6. Each of us has turned what? To his own way. But my friend, salvation has been provided. When Jesus Christ died on the cross so that you and I might be saved from our sin. That you and I might have eternity and a hope of heaven. But listen, you must choose him. No one else can do it for you. Listen, getting in the church building, you can't just kind of accidentally rub up against salvation and get saved. You don't just kind of trip into salvation. Oops, I I really didn't mean to get saved today, but it it just kind of happened. It doesn't work that way. The Bible says you've got to choose. You've got to make a choice. You see, when you go to the doctor, the doctor, maybe you go to the doctor and you've been sick or maybe, you know, I know a lot of people uh, the last few weeks have had a lot of sinus stuff going on and you've got a sinus infection and it's going crazy and so you finally break down and say, I'm going to go to the doctor and the doctor says, okay, you need this medicine and he gets out this little pad of paper and he writes in secret code that only the pharmacist knows. (laughs) I've always been amazed. These doctors, they go to Uh, all this medical school, pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to be educated, and nobody in all that time teaches them how to write. (laughs) But they get the little pad of paper out, and they write on there, I want so-and-so to have this medicine, and I want them to take so many of them for so many days, here's the key, until they're all gone. Key word there. Until they're all gone, I want you to do this. And if you'll do this, you're going to get well. Well, you take that little piece of paper and you go down here to CVS Pharmacy and you walk in and you give that piece of paper that they're the only ones that know how to, to read it and define what it says. And in a few minutes, they'll call your name and they'll give you this little sack. In that little sack will be a bottle. In there's some medicine. And on the bottle, we'll give directions. You take three of these a day. For 10 days, and then 10 days, you're going to be a whole lot better. Well, if you go home and you take that bottle and you set it up on the shelf and you just keep walking around the house saying, I've got the medicine, I'm going to get better. Well, I've got, you know, it may be if I set it close by my head at night, set it on the nightstand, and I got the medicine, it's the answer, and I set it on the nightstand while I'm sleeping, it will just ooze over from the nightstand into my body. 
and I'll get well. How many of you know that won't work? You've got to take the medicine. You've got to choose to take the medicine and apply it to your life. Friend, you can know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can have heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can even come and sit in a church like this where the gospel of Jesus Christ is presented. But each one of us has to make a choice. We've got to choose to yield our heart and life to Jesus Christ. Remember, we are sinners in need of a Savior. We've got to choose to let him be the Lord of our life. So you got to make a choice. John 1 and 12 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Acts 16 and 31, they reply, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Friend, believe that he can save you. Believe that he can forgive you and wipe away. And as we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my sin from me. How many of you have found him to be the God of second chances? I'm glad he doesn't give up on us. He's the God of second chances. Believe in his power to forgive. He's the God who can make all things new. Believe in his power to turn your life around. Maybe you know this morning what I'm talking about. And you say, you know what, Pastor? I know that, and I've heard that truth, and, and I've come to church. And you say, you know what? One of these days, Pastor, I'm going to do exactly what you've said. One of these days, you say, you know what? I'm, I'm actually here today because I've been thinking some things needed to change in my life. And I want you to know, Pastor, I'm thinking one day about yielding my heart and life to Jesus Christ. Friend, I want to share with you a passage from 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. And now is the day of salvation. We say, okay, pastor, I understand that. And, and, and I'm going to do that one of these days. Well, listen, friend, let me, let me share with you for a moment. This year, before the year's up, I'm pushing and I'm holding off this as long as I can. But before the year's over, I'm going to turn 50 years old. Now, I don't know how that's happened, but it's happening. And the amazing thing is, when I was 20, it didn't seem like too many of my friends were dying. Let me tell you. Every year that goes by, I have more and more and more, more of my friends that are dying. I was just, Friday, I was at home, and the UPS truck pulled up to our house, and I went out to get our Christmas presents. You know how it is when UPS comes. You're ready to get everything that you've ordered, and I went out there, and the guy driving was a guy that I went to school with, and so we got to chatting just about life and hadn't seen each other in a long time, and then he asked me, he said, hey, he said, didn't one of our friends just recently die? And, and one of the guys that we had went to school with just in the last month passed away. And he said, well, what, what, what happened? And, you know, what, what was the cause? And I said, well, he had been out to La Charetas and, and uh, had been out there. And uh, they got ready to leave. And he came out. They opened the door, got ready to sit down in the car. And he collapsed into the car, never regained consciousness. Never breathed again, and today he's in eternity. Now, the truth is, you don't have to be 50 like we are. You can be 25. You can be half my age. Or you can be 75. Or you can be, yesterday to my wife, yes, he was out at the nursing home. She was walking down the hall, and this little lady came up to her. It was so funny. This little lady came up, and and started to hand up my wife. And my wife thought, oh, she's here and she's trying to give me what she has. And, and Paula said, oh, no, honey, you keep that for yourself. And she looked at her and she said, I want you to open it for me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be old to misunderstand what's going on, but she did. And so... She opened it for her, gave it back to her, and the lady said, do you know how old I am? And Paula said, no, honey. She said, I'm 106. 
wow is right. You never know. Friend, you might be 25, 50, 75, or 106. But the reality of the life that you and I live is not one of us in this room is guaranteed one more heartbeat. Why is that a big deal? Because the Bible tells us that if we don't know Jesus Christ, we're going into an eternity separated from God. Why is that a big deal? Because I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. And the Bible gives the answer to that. Now is the time of God's favor. Today is the day to be saved. And so I don't know what's brought you to this church today. But friend, my advice to you today, don't put it off. For there's no promise of tomorrow. There's no guarantee you'll have another opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Isaiah 55 and 6 says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Friend, the Bible declares this truth. And this is the power behind grace. It declares Jesus Christ is the only way for you and I to get to heaven. I want to ask you today, will you receive him into your life? But friend, you alone must choose to reject or accept God's gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. You might say, well, pastor, how do I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior? The Bible is clear. Believe with your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sin. Believe that Jesus Christ alone is the way to heaven. Ask him to forgive your sin and to make you new in him. Listen, it's not hard. You just got to believe. You just got to believe that I don't have what it takes to get there, but he does have what it takes to get me there. Believe in Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Friend, with your head bowed and your eyes closed in this room, and for the next few moments, I just want to talk to you for the reality of my life and your life. And as you are gathered in this place together with me today, friend, when we began to talk about eternity and we began to talk about heaven and we began to talk about being ready for heaven and we began to talk about eternal life, friend, if you're a little bit nervous when we talk about that. Maybe you're here and you say, you know what, Pastor, I, I believe in heaven, I believe in Jesus, but, but you say, Pastor, when, when I have to consider eternity, I'm a little nervous about whether I'm ready for heaven today. You know, you might say, well, Pastor, I was baptized as a child, or maybe I prayed a prayer with somebody when I was a child. Listen, friend, I think that's wonderful, but I want to ask you something. Are you ready for heaven today? Are you ready for heaven today? Friend, if you're not, I want to tell you, the Bible says now is the time of God's favor and now is the time to be saved today. Oh, it's not another day. It's not another week. It's not another sermon. Today's the day for you and I to make that decision. So friend, with heads bowed and eyes closed, right where you're sitting, right where you're sitting today. If you'd say, Pastor, I'm concerned about eternity and honestly, I'm a little worried about whether I'm ready for heaven or not. You say, I just want to leave this place knowing that I'm ready. I don't want to guess. I don't want to be nervous about it. I want to leave this church today knowing that I'm ready for heaven. And this morning, friend, if that's you, with heads bowed, I'm not going to embarrass you or point you out. Just so that I'm able to remember you in prayer. Right where you're at, if you say, that's me, Pastor, would you just, would you just slip up your hand? Let me see it. Yes. 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 Others, you would, you would join these. You say, I'm, I'm concerned. Yes. I'm not sure that I'm ready. Yes, friend, you could put your hand down after you've raised it. Thank you. 
How many others you would say, Pastor, just remember me in prayer today? Yes. Oh, friend, he loves you so much. He loves you so much. How many others, you might raise your hand and say, that's me. Please remember me in prayer. I don't want to be nervous about it anymore. I want to know that I know that I know. Please remember me in prayer. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. All across this house, I want to invite everyone in this room to pray this prayer with me. Friend, if you lifted your hand, I'm going to tell you right front, there's nothing magical about my prayer. It's about believing in your heart. So, friend, if you believe the words we're getting ready to say, I believe today you are going to be born again. You are going to be saved, and you're going to know that you know that you know you're ready for heaven. So we're going to pray this prayer all across this room. Pray it with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus. I ask you today to forgive me of all my sin. Lord Jesus, I pray today you will completely cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I believe that you died on the cross to provide my salvation. I believe that you rose from the grave and you're alive today. I believe that you're coming again and you're going to receive us unto yourself. I believe you're able to make me ready for heaven. So in this moment, Make me ready. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, friend, it's not hard. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, you've done what's needed to be done. If we believe, the Bible says, we can be saved. He's your Savior and the Lord of your life. Well, this morning, we're going to share communion together. Now, maybe you're visiting with us today and you're not sure what communion is. Let me explain to you today what we're going to do. There's going to be some individuals. They're going to come and they're going to bring a couple trays. One of those trays is going to have cups and it's going to have some grape juice in it. That represents the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away all our sin. Then there's going to be another tray that's going to have some little wafers in it. Those little wafers, they just represent jesus body that was broken for us you see it's his body the bible says with his stripes we are healed that's spiritual healing physical healing emotional healing everything that makes you who you are healing for your whole person the blood of jesus christ cleanses us and what does the bible say it says we are to remember what he's done until he comes and so that's what we're doing today and maybe you say well I appreciate that, Pastor. I attend another church, and I probably shouldn't have communion here. Listen, friend, if you know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, we want to invite you to join with us in communion. You are so welcome to join with us today as we just celebrate what he's done for our lives. And so I'm going to ask all of the ushers if they'll come, and they're going to prepare today uh, to wait upon us and to serve us communion. And as they come by... Uh, you can take that emblem, just hold it, and then together as a group, we're going to take communion together this morning. Paula, would you lead us in some worship?
Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sacrifice that saved my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory.
Would you stand together with us this morning? Thank you, Jesus. When we read the scriptures, they come to us from 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In your hands today is the wafer and the cup. That wafer represents the body of Jesus Christ. Our text this morning said that it's by his stripes we are healed. Friend, not just spiritual healing, but physical healing, emotional healing, healing complete in your life. Would you join me and let's just hold up that little wafer and let's give him thanks for his body that was given for us. Lord Jesus, I thank you today. I thank you for your body that was given for us. Thank you for providing healing. Healing in our spirits. Making us brand new in you. Thank you for healing in our bodies. You are the God who heals all manner of sickness and disease. Thank you that you're the God who heals emotional wounds. You heal us emotionally physically, spiritually. Friend, right now, if you need healing in your life, would you just ask him right now, Lord, I need your healing. I need your healing in my life. I need your healing, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus. All across this room, Heavenly Father, we recognize you are the healer. We recognize you are our source. We recognize you for who you are today. Lord, heal right now, I pray in the name of Jesus. Heal in this moment and all across this room in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join me and let's take together the bread. Thank you, Jesus. Next, you hold in your hand a cup. That cup represents the blood of Jesus. Why is that important? The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Jesus Christ went to the cross. Not only did he die, but there he shed his blood so that you and I might be saved. Friend, do you remember when he forgave your sin? Do you remember when he cleansed your life? Would you lift up that cup and let's thank him today for his forgiveness. Lord, I thank you today that you have washed away my sin. I thank you that you've cleansed me. I thank you that, Lord, you have made me pure in your sight. Though I once only knew sin, you have made me and made all of us to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for your cleansing. And Lord, right now in this moment, I pray, Father, just a cleansing work in our lives. Lord, I pray there'll be no part dark in our hearts. No recessed areas of our life. No places of darkness in our mind, in our heart, in our life. I pray a cleansing in the name of Jesus. Lord, would you just wash us right now and make us clean. Wash us. 
Wash us, I pray. Create in us a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within us, we pray. We thank you, Lord, for your cleansing. We thank you for forgiveness. And we thank you for your blood that washes away all our sin. In Jesus' name, would you join me and let's take the cup together. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for what you've done in our lives. I thank you, Lord, that once we were not a people, but now we have become the people of God. Thank you, Lord, that you have made us your sons and your daughters. Thank you, Lord, that you made us your very own. Thank you, Lord, today that we have the hope of heaven. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that promise. And, Lord, we hold on to that and we cling to it today. Thank you, Lord, for your hand upon each one of us. And now, Lord, today we still remember those, Lord, today in Florida who are walking through great difficulty today. Lord, I pray you'll be their covering. I pray you'll be the shelter in the storm. I pray you'll be a safe safe refuge. Lord, the word says you're a very present help in the time of trouble. God, would you be there? Be there in the shelters. Be there in the homes. Be there in the cities. Be there in the country. Be there with them, oh God, and keep your hand upon them. And Father, I pray for these people gathered in this place. Father, would you keep them safe as they travel home today? I pray the blessing of the Lord will continue to rest upon their life. And Father, as the Word says, I pray the blessing will not only be in their life, but the blessing will overtake their life. Everything they put their hands to, that Father, you'll cause it to prosper that your name is glorified in their life. Keep each one of them safe, Lord, until you bring us back together in your house. Be with them now, and I pray the joy of the Lord will always be their strength. In Jesus' name I pray, and all the church said, amen. Amen. May God bless you today. May his grace and strength go with you. Have a great day. God bless.